So I wanted to start off today's video with a question. Say all you have to your name is one pound and your bank writes to you and says that they're going to be doubling your bank account balance every four days until you become a millionaire. Now, in this unfortunate fictional scenario, you have literally no income. So how long do you think it's going to take for you to become a millionaire, for you to get the million? Is it a matter of days, weeks, months, years maybe? Have a little think about it and think of a ballpark figure. You know, have a feel for it. I'm not looking for you to actually work it out mathematically, just have a feel for it. And we'll talk about it in a moment. Okay guys, so whilst you have a little think about that, if you're new here, then uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Kieran McAvoy, and on this channel I chat about maths and engineering, so if that sounds like your cup of tea, then uh, consider subscribing. Now, I especially like understanding the and explaining the maths, the mathematical reasons behind things, which is why today we're going to be discussing and hopefully gaining a better appreciation and understanding of exponential growth. So how long do you think it would take to reach the million? Comment down below what you thought because I'd be really interested to hear what the kind of vibe is. Okay, to get to a million from one pound with your bank doubling every four days takes less than a year. It takes less than half a year. In fact, it only takes 80 days. 80 days and then you're a millionaire. <sighs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Right, okay, let's just, you know, take a moment now and compose ourselves because this isn't reality. Let's go through it. The day that you heard this sadly unrealistic proposal will call day zero and you had one pound in your bank account. Now, four days later, it gets doubled. So you have two pounds in your bank account. Another four days later, it gets doubled again and you have four pounds in your bank account. Another four days, you have eight pounds in your bank account, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128, then 256, and then 512. We're only on day 36 and we've only got 512 pounds. I mean, you know, nothing to be sniffed at, but come on, we're after the million here. There's no way we're gonna reach a million in 80 days, surely not. Well, let's see if we can see a pattern here. All of these quantities exist because we've been multiplying by two each time. We've started off with one pound, and then we've multiplied by two to get two pounds, and then we've multiplied by two again to get four pounds, and again to get eight pounds, and so on. And what we can see is that this is the sequence of the powers of two. Two to the power of zero is one, two to the power of one is two, two to the power of two is four, two to the power of three is eight, and so on. And so the question really is, what power of two is greater than a million? Now, although you can do this iteratively, doubling your answer as you go, it's far easier to use a logarithm where we ask, what power must two be put to in order to equal a million? And the answer, rounded to two decimal places, is 19.93. And since in our fictional reality, we were receiving a new power of two every four days, we reveal that we would receive the one million pounds in our bank account on the 80th day. Now that feeling that we had when we had only 512 quid on day 36 can cause disbelief and overconfidence in our estimates, known as exponential growth bias. For more perspective, let's say you wanted to be an out-of-this-world quintillionaire. That's a trillion lots of a million. Or in other words, a million lots of a million, and then that million lots of a million, a million times. Like, we're talking one with 18 zeros after it. 12,000 times the gross domestic product of the world. How many days do you think it would take for you to get to that ridiculous sum of money if it was doubling every four days. Well, you wouldn't even have to wait for a whole year. You wouldn't even be near the end of the year. It would only take 240 days for you to reach your quintillion. If you started this 
with one pound in your bank on the 1st of January, you would only be reaching the end of August before you were a quintillionaire. This demonstrates what I like to think of as the surprising aspect of exponential growth. Because it surprises you, it creeps up on you. You, you know, one minute we're at 512 on day 36 and the next minute we're at a quintillion on day 240. Not even a year has passed. And it's because of this that it's so difficult to fathom. And it's so difficult to talk about in casual conversations, you know, down at the pub. Because we're so used to things adding up linearly, like a regular paycheck. And it's for this reason that we instinctively comprehend exponential growth as linear growth. So what makes the powers of two example exponential? Is it the fact that we've been multiplying by two? Is that the thing that makes it exponential? Well, no. It's, it's just the fact that we've been multiplying by a number consistently greater than one. That's, that's the key. If you ever have a recurring sequence where the new term in the sequence is the old term multiplied by a number greater than one, even if it's ever so slightly greater than one, the growth of that sequence will be exponential. For instance, would you believe me if I were to tell you that by investing your money into a fixed 1.5% interest rate savings account, it would grow exponentially. Well, it would. It follows the same pattern. We're multiplying the previous year's balance by 1.015 to get our new balance. That's the key difference between linear growth and exponential growth. With linear growth, we're adding to the previous term. For instance, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 and so on. Whereas exponential growth, we're multiplying the previous term. 1 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 and so on. And it's this recurring relation that explains that if something's growing exponentially, its growth is proportional to the current amount. For instance, if we were at 512 in our exponential growth sequence of the powers of 2, then the next one in the sequence is 1024 because we've multiplied 512 by 2. Whereas if we're in our linear sequence of adding 2, then the next term in the sequence, if we're at 512, is just going to be 514. So its growth remains constant. So the larger the number you have in an exponential sequence, the greater the jump is to the next term. Unfortunately, the word exponential gets used commonly in conversations to mean rapid or fast. And this drives misconceptions, since exponential growth, you know, as we see from bank interest rates, doesn't always come across as rapid growth. So a more prominent word to describe it I would use is uncontrollable. Now, in recent times, you've probably heard the term exponential growth being thrown about with regards to COVID-19. And I already have a video out explaining and going through a common mathematical model used to model epidemics. So I'm not going to go back into that here. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually take a moment to think about the growth of the infections of COVID-19 with regards to this exponential growth bias, in light of this exponential growth bias, because we've just said that exponential growth doesn't have to be rapid and doesn't have to involve large numbers immediately. But what it does have are aspects of uncontrollability and surprise. Unfortunately, our exponential growth bias isn't really helped by the way in which we're shown data by the media and the news. And I'm not digressing whether that data is accurate here. That's not the point. The point is, is how we're actually shown that data. And as you'll see, it kind of makes sense why they show it that way, but it doesn't really help when you want to get the feel of the data. For instance, let's have a look at this graph of the worldwide infections of COVID-19 from the end of January. Well, that doesn't look too comforting, does it? So what are the values of the tick marks on the vertical axis? Well, we start at zero, then we have 5 million, then 10 million, then 15 million. We're adding 5 million each time. So it's a linear scale on that vertical axis. Now let's look at another graph. 
same date range, same purpose, showing the worldwide infections. But my, my, we're doing so much better. I mean, that looks so good. We're flattening out at the top. I mean, surely we're doing, surely we're onto a winner here. Maybe, maybe it's from a different data source. Well, actually, no, it's showing exactly the same data as the first graph. When we look at the vertical axis, it's a log base 10 scale, which means that each tick mark is equally spaced from one another, but it's going up in powers of 10, 100 to 1000 to 10,000 to 100,000 and so on. Now, I'm not going to get into the mathematics of logarithms here, but an important thing to take away from this is to check your axes when you are shown any sort of graph from the media or the news, because commonly, like I said, they tend to scale the vertical axis in some form of scaling, in some form of log scaling, like uh, powers of 10 or powers of 2. And this is just so that then they can fit all of the data onto one graph. And they usually leave the horizontal axis as a linear scale of time to show the passage of time. And an important thing to know about when looking at a logarithmic graph is that a purely exponential function plotted on the graph will produce a perfectly straight positive line. So if when looking at one of these graphs, you notice a general straight positive trend line through multiple data points, that shows us exponential growth. It's generally very easy to be overconfident in our own intuition regarding exponential growth. And less optimal decisions tend to be made on this bias. The point is, it's okay. It's normal. In fact, I would not recommend ever trying to guess or have a, a feel for what your compound interest savings could potentially be, or guessing the future amount of COVID-19 cases, because studies show we're just not that good at it. Instead, I'd recommend a more beneficial out attitude towards it is actually respecting its uncontrollability or genuinely sitting down and getting calculating because there's nothing wrong with following through with the maths. It's the intuition, it's our own feel of exponential growth that tends to let us down. Overcoming or respecting the notion of exponential growth bias has been shown to positively affect people's attitudes towards investing and saving. Maybe in the same way, it could positively affect people's attitudes towards social distancing and the maintenance of hygiene. Thanks very much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, be sure to leave it a like. Subscribe if you want to stick around and catch me on Instagram at Kieran WA McAvoy. Thank you all very much for watching. I will see you all in the next video. Bye bye.